Welcome to the Electronic Animated YouTube channel. After watching this video, you will understand how the I square C bus works. First, we will see the general architecture of the I square C bus and how electronic components use this bus to exchange data. Then we will see how the bus works on the physical level at the level of the electrical connections and signals. Some chip manufacturers use the name TWI, two-wire interface, instead of I2C, principally for trademark issues. The TWI bus is a bus compatible with I2C, but without some features. Atmel, the Arduino Uno microcontrollers manufacturer, use the name TWI instead of I2C. The I2C bus is a data bus allowing electronic components to exchange data between themselves. To be able to use this bus, the components must follow the I2C specifications from the physical point of view, at the electrical level, and at the protocol level, what signals must be generated and in which order. It is theoretically possible to connect on the I2C bus as many components as wanted. However, the degradation of the electrical signals caused by each added component and the number of addresses available limit the number of chips on the bus. The I2C bus is a serial bus, so it can only hold one data at a given time. Five distinct data can be on the I2C bus. The start or restart signal. The stop signal. The data bit, 1. The data bit, 0. And the idle state. The bus state when not used by any component. To send multiple data using the I2C bus, a component must send them one after the other. In other words, transmitting them serially. The components on the I2C bus must have a specific role. They can act as a master or as a slave. A master can take control of the bus to use it to send requests to the slaves. A slave can't take control of the bus, it can only answer to the master's requests. Generally, slaves' components on the I2C bus are components that generate data, like a temperature sensor, or components that receive orders, a component used to control an electrical motor, for example. Components acting as masters are generally microcontrollers getting data from the slaves or sending them orders. There can be more than one master and one slave on the I2C bus. When the I2C bus is used by a master, the other masters can't use it. They have to wait for the bus to be released by the master using it. After taking control of the bus, the master must tell with which slave it wants to communicate. The slave selected by the master is then allowed to communicate on the bus to answer the master's request. To select a slave, the master must use the slave's identification number. This number is unique for each slave and it's called the slave's address. The slave address is encoded on 7 bits. So, there are 2 to the power of 7th, 128 available addresses. The component's manufacturer gives the slave its address. Sometimes, it's possible to choose between 2 or 4 pre-assigned addresses by connecting some of the component's pins to the ground or the 5 volts. Now that we have seen the general architecture of the I2C bus, we will see the protocol that the masters must follow to be able to communicate with the slaves. To communicate with the slaves, the masters must use requests that have a specific structure. On the I2C bus, there are two types of requests. A write request of one or more 8 bits data, or a read request of one or more 8 bits data. A write request is a request where a master will send one or more 8 bits data to a slave. 
A read request is a request where a master will receive one or more 8 bits data from a slave. A request always starts with a master setting the start signal on the I2C bus. This signal can only be generated when the bus is free, idle, when it is not used by any master. After sending the start signal, the master must indicate which slave is the target of the request. To do it, it sends the 7 bits of the slave address. We can note that the address is sent the most significant bit first. Once the 7 bits of the slave address are sent, the master must indicate the type of request it wants to use. To do this, it sends a bit of data. 0 for a write request, 1 for a read request. At this point, the slave with this address must tell the master that it's on the bus and ready to receive the next part of the request. The slave does it by sending the acknowledgement signal, ACK, by setting the data bit 0 on the bus. If it's a write request, the master then sends the 8 bits data that the slave must acknowledge. If the master wants to send another 8 bits of data, it does so, and the slave acknowledges. This way, the master can send multiple 8 bits data in a row. Once the master has sent the last data it wanted to send, after the last slave's acknowledgement, it sets the stop signal on the bus. The stop signal indicates the end of the request and the release of the bus, allowing other masters to use it. If the request is a read request, after the master has sent the slave address, the request type, and the slave has acknowledged, the slave sends the 8 bits data to the master. If the master wants to receive another 8 bits data, it acknowledges by setting the data bit 0 on the bus. The slave then sends another 8 bits of data. The master can this way receive multiple 8 bits data in a row. When the master wants to stop the read request, instead of acknowledging the last data sent by the slave, by setting the data bit 0 on the bus, it sends the NACK not acknowledge signal. The NACK signal is generated by setting the data 1 on the bus. This signal informs the slave that it needs to stop sending data. The master then closes the request and releases the bus by sending the stop signal. We just saw the protocol that the masters must follow to be able to send a write or a read request to a slave. To sum up, the write and the read requests start the same by the start signal and the slave address. Only the request's type changes. 0 for a write request, 1 for a read request. Then for the two requests types, the slave acknowledges. For a write request, it's the master that sends the 8-bit data, whereas for the read request it's the slave that sends the 8-bit data. For a write request, the slaves acknowledge the received data, and the master sends another 8-bit data, or it ends the request by sending the stop signal. For a read request, the master acknowledges the received data if it wants to receive another 8-bit data, otherwise, it ends the request by sending the not acknowledged signal followed by the stop signal. The I2C protocol allows a master to keep control of the bus between two requests. If a master wants to do a write request followed by a read request without risking losing control of the bus at the end of the first request, it can keep control of the bus by not ending the first request by a stop signal. This way, the other masters don't see the stop signal and won't try to use the bus. In this case, the start signal of the next request is called restart. 
The master can this way send multiple requests in a row without releasing the bus. At the end of the last request the master wanted to send, it needs to send the stop signal to release the bus. The I2C specification says how data are exchanged between masters and slaves, but it doesn't tell which data must be sent. The components implementing the I2C bus as slaves must indicate in their datasheet how the masters must interact with them. Although there are no specifications on the data to send, most of the slaves on the I2C bus behave the same. Generally, a slave has registers that can be read or written by the I2C bus. A register is identified by a unique number of 8 bits and contains 8-bit data. For example, if I take a component with three sensors, a temperature, humidity, and a brightness sensor. This component has six registers numbered from 0 to 5. Register 0, 1, 2 store the configuration of the sensors, and registers 3, 4, 5, store the values generated by the sensors. To change the value of a register by the I2C bus, a master must use a write request of two data. The first data of the write request is the number of the register to update, and the second data is the new value for the register. For example, to set the value 71 in register 1. The master must send the slave address and send as first data the number of the register 1 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1 in binary and as second data the new value for the register 71 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1 in binary. To get the value of a register, the master must combine two requests. First, it must use a write request of one data containing the number of the register to read. Then it must use a read request of one data. Without the write request first, the slave doesn't know which data it must send for the read request. If we continue our example, to retrieve the value in register 3, the master sends the slave address in the data 3, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1 in binary. Then it sends the slave address again for the read request. And the slave sends the data in register 3, 25, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1 in binary. Now that we have seen how the I2C bus works from a protocol point of view, we will see how it works from a physical point of view, at the electrical level. The I2C bus has two electrical connections. The first connection is the serial data line, SDA. The second connection is the serial clock line, SCL. SDA transmits data. SCL synchronizes the data transfer. The SCL synchronization tells when the data on SDA can be modified and when the new data on SDA can be read. Each line can be in the low state, 0 volts, or the high state, generally 5 volts or 3.3 volts. By default, both lines must be set in the high state using two pull up resistors. To change the state of the lines, the electrical components use transistors. Each component connected on the I2C bus has a transistor for each line of the bus. This allows the component to connect a line to the zero volts, forcing it in the low state, or keeping it in the high state by not connecting it to the zero volts. When a component doesn't force a line in the low state, it must be able to read the state of the line because the line can be forced to zero volts by another component. In this example, component 2 forces the SDA line in the low state by connecting it to zero volts, 
while component 1 tries to keep it in the high state by not connecting the line to the zero volts. The low state has priority over the high state. If a component wants a line in the low state, and another component wants to keep it in the high state, the low state will be the state on the line. When the I square C bus is not used by any component, it's in the idle state. All components must keep the lines in the high state. When a master wants to send a request using the I square C bus, it must first generate the start signal. It can only generate this signal if the bus is free, in idle. The start signal is generated by changing the state of SDA from high to low while keeping SCL in the high state. Once the start signal is generated, the master must send the 8 bits containing the slave address and the request type. To send a bit of data, 0 or 1, there are two phases. In the first phase, the master must change the state of SCL from the high state to the low state, and it must keep it in the low state for a specific duration. While SCL is in the low state, the master must set SDA to low if it wants to send the data bit 0, or it must set SDA to high if it wants to send the data bit 1. In the second phase, the master must change the state of SCL from the low state to the high state and it must keep it in the high state for a specific duration. While the SCL is at the high state, the slave must read the bit of data on the SDA line. In this second phase, when SCL is in the high state, the SDA state must not be changed. The duration of SCL in the low state and the high state for each phase depends on the bus speed. The faster the bus is, the less time the phases last. The master repeats the two phases for the next bits of the request, for the slave address and the request type. For the slave acknowledgement, the master keeps changing the state of SCL for each phase, but this time it's the slave that sets the state on SDA during the first phase and that keeps it at this state during the second phase, and the master that reads the state of SDA during the second phase. If the acknowledgement is correct, the master must read the value 0 on SDA during the second phase. after the slave's acknowledgement. If it's a right request, the master sends to the slave the 8 bits data, and the slave acknowledges them. After the slave acknowledgement, the master can stop the request by sending the stop signal. To generate the stop signal, the master must do like it's sending the bit 0. It sets SDA to the low state during phase 1, but during phase 2, instead of keeping SDA low, it sets it at the high state. This violates the rule that wants that the SDA state doesn't change during the second phase. This violation indicates that it's a stop signal that's transmitted instead of the data bit zero. After sending the stop signal, the master leaves SDA and SCL in the high state, the bus goes idle. after the slave's acknowledgement. If it's a read request, the slave sends to the master the 8 bits of data by changing the state on SDA during the first phases, and the master acknowledges them if it wants to receive another 8-bit data, or the master doesn't acknowledge and sends the stop signal. It's important to note that SCL is always generated by the master, even when it's the slave that controls SDA. The last signal to see is the restart signal. This signal is generated like the start signal by changing the state of SDA from high to low while SCL is in the high state. 
The restart signal is generated instead of the start signal and the preceding request has not been ended by a stop signal. The previous request was either a write or a read request. In either case, the restart signal is generated by the master like it's sending a 1. It sets SDA in the high state during phase 1, but instead of keeping it high during the second phase, it set it to low. This violates the rule that wants that the SDA state doesn't change during the second phase. This violation indicates that it's the restart signal that's transmitted instead of the data bit 1. To summarize, the start signal is generated by a master and can only be generated when the bus is idle. To generate the start signal the master must change the state of SDA from high to low while keeping SEL in the high state. The transmission of a bit of data 0 or 1 is done in two phases. During the first phase, the master sets SCL in the low state and keeps it in this state for a specific duration. During the second phase, the master sets SCL in the high state and keeps it in this state for a specific duration. If it's the master that wants to transfer the bit 0 to the slave, the master sets SDA in the low state during phase 1 and keeps this state during phase 2 and the slave reads the bit value on SDA during phase 2. If it's the master that wants to transfer the bit 1 to the slave, the master sets SDA in the high state during phase 1 and keeps this state during phase 2, and the slave reads the bit value on SDA during phase 2. If it's the slave that wants to transfer the bit 0 to the master, the slave sets SDA in the low state during phase 1 and keeps this state during phase 2, and the master reads the bit value on SDA during phase 2. If it's the slave that wants to transfer the bit 1 to the master, the slave sets SDA in the high state during phase 1 and keeps this state during phase 2, and the master reads the bit value on SDA during phase 2. The restart signal is generated by the master following a request not ended by a stop signal. The restart signal is done like if the master is sending the data bit 1 by setting SDA in the high state during phase 1, but instead of keeping SDA in the high state during phase 2, the master changes the SDA state from high to low during this phase. The stop signal is generated by the master to release the bus. The stop signal is done like if the master is sending the data bit 0 by setting SDA in the low state during phase 1, but instead of keeping SDA in the low state during phase 2, the master changes the SDA state from low to high during this phase. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe.